Now we're going to move on to the argument on the children and of course the mothers, saying that the mothers and children were forced into working in the factories and that there was this child exploitation, etc, etc. But the truth of the matter is, mothers and children were not forced into working in the factories. The mothers and children actually viewed the factories as salvation. To put this into perspective to help you understand, if you were to look at, for example, myself today, and many people around my age, now I was born in 1984, I'm 35, before the likes of the internet, before the likes of all of the luxury you have today with the touchscreen technology etc, with the mobile telephones and all the other goodies that you have, I think even in 1997 the fastest computer was 200 megahertz that we thought was amazing, you cannot feel deprived about something that doesn't exist there. How could I feel deprived about not having a computer that I didn't know existed? How could I feel deprived about internet that didn't exist here? How could I feel deprived about anything that you have today if in 1991 I didn't know existed? In fact, it wasn't existent. The World Wide Web didn't come around until 1997. I can tell you that fact because I grew up during it. How life was for us in the period before the internet and before all these mobile telephones that became fashionable, don't get me wrong, you had these walkie-talkies and you had, no doubt, you know, mobiles for the sake of business or whatnot, but it wasn't fashionable among society. We never had what you have today. We didn't feel deprived of it. We just thought, life was just simply great, life was just normal. We just got on with life and we we enjoyed what we had. That's even the same thing for people who lived before me. I could look at people from who were born in the 1940s and 1950s. I no doubt you know, you know, grandparents and, and parents who speak about the great life that they had when they were younger. You know, they were born into a period where these things just simply did not exist. So they couldn't feel deprived of it. It's the same thing for people living in the 1760s. Don't get me wrong, they acknowledge the fact that yes, that life was simply horrible having to work more than 80 hours per week, and life was simply torrid for that matter, but they could not feel deprived about, you know, toilets and toilet paper that didn't even come around until, what was it, about the 1880s or something like that? You know, how they went out and did the toilet outside was just normal to them. And we can certainly look at that time period as awful living conditions etc, and awful working conditions, but that's coming from the perspective of your mind. That's not coming from the perspective of where they came from working in and where they came from living before that existed. And you cannot go from A to Z overnight. In other words, what I'm saying is, you cannot go from 1760s living conditions to 2019's living conditions uh, over the course of one year. That just isn't the real world. They viewed these factories as a means to escape the rife misery that they were living in working endless hours on a farm. And not only did their working hours reduce, their living conditions had improved. There was more things innovated during the first industrial revolution, so there was more to go around everyone. Society collectively was actually richer. You could contrast the wealth of the people between 1650 to 1700, and then contrast that to the people living in 1850. It is abundantly clear to see that those who were living before the industrial revolution, that the masses were living in extreme poverty. Most of the wealth was based on building and land ownership. That wealth was mostly put in the hands of the 2%, the aristocracy. Yet you would see a dramatic change by 1850, proving that the Industrial Revolution and the First Industrial Revolution actually did see an improvement in the wealth and material living standards of the people, of the masses. You've got to remember in 1760, Basically, everyone was living dirt poor. So what the factories gave them was opportunity to make something of their life. And it is an historical fact that something unprecedented happened. Unprecedented means it's never been seen before in human history. And what was that? 
for the first time in human history between 1780 to 1820 you would see the average poor person's real wage earning growth rate increase by 0.55% per year and then by 1820 to 1850 you would see the real wage earning growth rate increase by 1.2% per year on average. In the United States of America, their real wage earning growth rate was 1.6% per year on average. In other words, the rich were getting richer and who was it that benefited the most? It was the poor. The poor were growing richer faster. There was no dangerous concentration of wealth in the hands of the few because between 1840 in the United States to 1900, 70% of the wealth remained steadily the same going to that of the working class and the remaining 30% would go to the capital owners, those so-called capitalists running the factories, etc. When you talk about child exploitation, what does it mean by exploitation? How could it be exploitative? They were seeing their working hours reduce. They were seeing their living conditions dramatically improve. Not only that, their wages were continuously increasing. So they were becoming better off in life. That's not exploitation. To exploit someone is to get as much out of them as possible and give them little in return. That's a complete contradiction to the history of the first industrial revolution and the real wage earning growth rate statistics back that evidence. But when you talk about the children and mothers, they weren't forced into working in the factories. The truth of the matter was the mothers held the power to prevent their children from working in the factories. So why didn't they? Because they were going to die of starvation. That's why they didn't. They didn't have a choice in the issue. The only reason why a choice later became something was because they were able to reduce their working hours and, pr and, and improve their wealth as a whole. They were getting richer because their wages would continuously improve, their material wealth would improve, their working hours would reduce, and as a result of that, they then had the luxury to then keep their children out of the dangerous workplace. Now, it is true to say that yes, in Great Britain, government legislation would come along to prevent the children from working in the dangerous factories. But irrespective of that, the market would have solved the problem anyway. And the United States of America proved that evidence within a, a country of a far greater population and of, a, of far greater size. What happened was, over time, the children would be kept out of the dangerous workplace and they were sent home and off to school long before the child labour laws were even codified. This was proven in the United States. They were being kept out of the dangerous workplace long before government legislation. So that debunks that entire myth. It wasn't a case that there was one group of children. That wasn't the case. Yes, you had the pauper children who came from, you know, living and working in the farms and lived with their mothers. And then you had the other group of children who were orphans who would live under the state. How convenient. They would spread the myth that it was all down to the evil capitalist factory owners that would, you know, poorly mistreat the children and beat them up. Just like the myth that they forced them into working in the factories. Well, it's no different to this myth. Because the children that were being poorly mistreated were actually the very children who were orphans who were living under the state. And who poorly mistreated them? The government. Government creates a problem and then pushes the blame off onto the factory owners and paints this entire story of history that it was all down to the evil capitalist factory owners. And they get away with that because, oh, look at the awful living conditions. Look at the awful working conditions. Look at how they forced them into working in the factories. Ralph Reichel had mentioned himself, even from that critic of capitalism, E.P. Thompson, an historian, was forced into a concession to say that the children had always worked long before the factories had ever come around. It's a concession to say that, you know, it's not a case that 
these capitalist factory owners are evil because they're making children work. The way that they paint the history is almost as if to say that children were free from working until these evil factories came along. And that's exactly how they paint this period of history. With their living conditions improving, their working hours reducing, their wages improving, that's not exploitation. That's an improvement of their life. Had it not been for the factories, had it not been for the machinery, you would not have had the luxury that you have today. Even that of the mothers. They did hold the power to prevent their children from working in the factories, they just never because of the very fact that the farms were just as dangerous, if not more dangerous, the children were going to die of starvation had they not. On the final argument on the NHS, you would get the likes of Jeremy Corbyn coming out and saying, well, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, socialism with the NHS, people would be left dying by their thousands. It's an historical fact that between 1760 to 1919, life expectancy would more than double, the population would more than triple, and the reason why it's erroneous to compare 1948 when the NHS came around to the 19th century is because obviously people were going to be better off in the late 1940s, not because of the NHS, but because of the fact that medical discoveries were yet to come around. During the 19th century, yes, you would see innovation, you would find medical discoveries continuously coming around, people's you know, life expectancy improved and people's living, you know, the population was able to increase because they were coming away from all these malnutrition diseases, etc. And that was thanks to the med medical discoveries. So obviously, someone living in the late 19th century is not going to be better off than that of someone living in the late 1940s. That's simply because of the fact that so much more was yet to be discovered. So it wasn't because a healthcare system was nationalised that made them better off. It was simply because, over time, more and more medical discoveries would come around and healthcare would simply advance. Now, the healthcare system itself in the NHS is a disastrous failure. In American healthcare, you could see the contrasting difference between the free market healthcare system and how it operated to that of today's American healthcare system where costs are through the roof because of all of the socialist government interventionism. Again, I've even touched upon why American healthcare costs sold out of control. You can check that out in the video that I did in response on Vox. So anyway folk, I hope I've covered enough and I hope you've taken something from it. If you've got anything you would like to add, comment in the comment section below and I'll be sure to get back to you. Thank you for watching my video and I shall talk to you later. Cheers.